So let's go ahead and stand, if you would, with that thought in mind. Grab your Bible. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter number 20 this morning. We're continuing through this series on things that hurt the church. We've been following the storyline of King David's life because he is truly the greatest king Israel ever had. Uh, there's no king like him. The only one that's going to be better than him is when the Lord Jesus Christ sits on the throne in Jerusalem, and he will do that according to Bible prophecy. And in spite of the fact that David was the greatest king Israel ever had, David made some big mistakes. David had some errors in judgment. And on top of that, David had some people around him that made some huge mistakes. And the fact of the matter is, is that no matter you know, whether you're trying to sincerely do right or not, life is still tough and things still happen and other people in your life make decisions that hurt you. No matter how great your church is, how much you love your church, how, how, how uh, close we are, it's a church family. That's kind of why I like, you know, asking who has a birthday this week and singing happy birthday. It's just a little bit of a personal touch, you know what I mean? No matter how close you are to your church family, we're all sinners. And as a result, sinners sin. That's why you pay me the big bucks for genius comments like that. But the fact of the matter is that sinners sin, right? And sin brings pain. So no matter where you go, what church you're a part of, no matter what, you're going to run into problems. I don't care how much you love your family. You're going to run into problems. And so we're talking about things that hurt the church because, first of all, I want to know what's coming. And then second of all, I want to know how to avoid anything I can avoid. Anything I can do to not be part of the problem, I want to do. Thirdly, I want to make sure that when a problem comes, my reaction to the problem doesn't make the problem worse than the problem actually would have been. And that's what we're trying to follow as we go through the storyline of David's life. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, we come to this story here this morning. And there happened to be there a man of Belial whose name was Sheba, the son of Bishri, a Benjaminite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his own to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bishri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king. From Jordan, even to Jerusalem. What I want to preach to you on this morning is cleaving to the king. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. We come to you again in prayer, Lord, not just because it's what we do at this time, but because we really believe that you're God and that you hear and answer prayers. And I pray now, Father, as we look at this story, that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help me to be faithful and consistent to the words of Scripture. Help the people to see what the scriptures say, and I pray that you'd help us to make good application to our lives so we can leave here, Lord, better off than we were when we came. And in order to be that, we have to be a little bit more serious about walking with you and staying close to you. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, you know the storyline. David has been run off his throne by his own son, Absalom. Absalom, in your Old Testament, being one of the greatest types that there is in the Bible of the Antichrist. David got run off his own throne, and now he's on his way back to reclaim the throne in Jerusalem after the battle between Absalom's guys and David's guys took place, and David's guys won, and now David's on his way back to sit on his rightful throne. And you noticed in the verse, like I mentioned to you, it says, the men of Judah clave unto their king. I got thinking about that and just the picture that that creates for you and I. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ is not ruling and reigning right now on this earth. You do understand that, right? I'm sorry, but you hear all this fluffy talk from religious people about the kingdom and his kingdom and God's sovereign and God's in control and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I do believe in an almighty, all-powerful God. You do understand that, right? Yes, but the fact of the matter is, is that the Bible teaches us when we study the Bible that Satan is the God of this world in this present time and that there's principalities and powers ruling this world. They're the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. So right now, Jesus Christ is not the one running this show. If he was running this show, what's going on over in Russia and Ukraine would not be happening. If he was running this show, all the, all the atrocities and all the sin, all the wickedness, all the confusion, all the destruction, all that's going on in the world today would not be going on because when he rules and reigns in Jerusalem, he's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. You've got to understand that. That's Bible teaching. 
He's coming back to claim his throne. When he came the first time, the Jews rejected him. He came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. They, just, they said, we will not have this man reign over us. And they got the Roman government hooked up with them, and they crucified their Messiah. You understand that, right? He came preaching the kingdom of heaven. What he was saying is, is your Messiah is here. And then they were looking for a, 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 a military ruler to come and free them from Rome, but he wasn't preaching that message. And they, did, they rejected their king and crucified him. He's coming back to claim his kingdom. And the Bible teaches us that he is going to rule and reign on the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Your king is coming back to set up his kingdom. Now, in the meanwhile, some stuff's happening. He's not reigning right now. People get mad at God all the time for what's going on in the world around them or the things that happen to them. But folks, that ain't fair to God. He told you he's not running the show. The sin is running the show. Human nature is running the show. The devil's running the show. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not running this show. But he can run the show of your life if you'll allow him to. And he wants you to let him. King David is a great type of Jesus Christ as he got driven off of his own throne and Absalom steps in. And the funny thing is the vast majority of the people follow Absalom. The vast majority of Israel, a very small group of men left and went with David, but the vast majority of Israel had sided with Absalom because Absalom was, was beautiful as we already looked at. The Bible said there was no blemish in him. Absalom was a man of the people. He was a great politician. He told them exactly what they wanted to hear the way they wanted to hear it. He acted like everybody is ultra important. Oh, your matters are so important, but there's no man deputed of the king to hear you. Oh, that I were ruling in the land. Then would I hear you. You matter. You're the most important thing in the world. Your issues are the only issues that count. Oh, it's all about you, you, you on your iPhone and your YouTube and your... Never mind. I repeat myself too much. Do you understand the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the devil? It's to make it all about you all the time. When he showed up to Eve, what did he say? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It's you, more education, making your life better. God's holding you back. All the rules of God. Yea, hath God said, let's doubt what the Lord says. He approaches it positively. Yea, not negatively. Hath God said, and place a little doubt in her mind about what God said. That's a trick of the Antichrist. That's a trick of a deceiver. That is exactly what Absalom did when he came in to try to take his father's throne. Here he is, the greatest king Israel ever saw. I absolutely love David. He is one of my favorite Old Testament types. My favorite Old Testament character is King David. Do you know why? King David is the sweet psalmist of Israel. King David's the man that would take a, take a lame, crippled man, Mephibosheth, the, the, the son of his enemy, the bloodline of his enemy, and say, come into my house, I'll take care of you. You can't take care of yourself, I got you, bud, come with me. That's David. David's a man that, that man, he'll look out for those that are beneath him, he'll take care of people, he'll be kind to his enemy. When Shimei goes and cusses him and Abishai's like, let me take off his head. David's saying, leave him alone, man. You're too hard for me. Don't be so aggressive. He's just cussing me. God obviously let him cuss me or he wouldn't be cussing me. Leave him alone. That's David. You know what else I like about David? David was an absolute warrior. I like that. Sorry. That's just, I'm carnal, okay? I like the fact that that guy could fight. That guy could lead. He was absolutely fearless. When everybody else was afraid, he went out and said, I'll put my life on the line to kill Goliath, and you'll see what God Almighty will do for me. But if I die, I die. I don't care. Hey, listen, a lion came in and tried to go after my sheep, and when that lion, they were my responsibility. When that lion came in, I went after him. He didn't run like a stinking coward. I didn't put myself first. I didn't think I'm more important than them. I laid my life down on the line for a bunch of sheep. And guess what? God gave me the victory. A bear came in. I went after that bear. God was teaching me some things as a young man about doing my job and stepping up to the plate when I needed to step up and facing danger and being what I'm supposed to be to take care of what I'm told to take care of no matter what the cost. And God always stepped in for me. Now, I'm not letting that Goliath blaspheme God's people anymore. I'll go kill him. 
I like a guy like that. That's a king like, a king like that's a guy I can follow. You know what happened? You know what I like about David? He messed up. And I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not making excuses for messing up, especially on the level that David messed up on. It's absolutely horrible. One of my prayers to God is, God, you've given me a decent start in the ministry. Help me finish. I don't want to be one of these old guys that winds up messing up and stepping out on my wife and a disgrace to the church and a disgrace to God and all the rest. Of it. I don't want to finish like that. I want to finish my course with joy. I want to finish clean. I want to finish with a good testimony. I want to finish in the traces for God. You know what I like about David, though? Even though David messed up, he did not allow his failures to stop him from continuing to serve God. When David messed up, he could fess up. Thou art the man. You're right, I'm the man, Nathan. I'm on my knees. I'm begging God for mercy. I'm sorry. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't push it off on anybody else. You never find him one time trying to throw Bathsheba under the bus. Not one time. He says, it's my fault and I'm sorry. I did wrong. I like a guy like that. I can follow a king like that. But see, Absalom comes in and with his smooth charms, with his sweet talk, with this culturally acceptable way of presenting himself all the time. He's like a used car salesman. Can I ask you a question? I'm not trying to be a jerk right now. What is wrong with some people? Why is it that you want a guy like that to preach to you on Sunday morning? You can't sniff that out? Well, that preacher, he talks so rough. and he's, I, I mean, nothing in you says, hey, at least he's not trying to get our money. Because if a guy's trying to get our money, he don't look at us and say, knock it off. The Bible says it whether you like it or not. <laughs> what? <laughs> at least he's not working an angle. I mean, what is church all about? Is this serious? Is this legitimate? Is there a God in heaven? Did he write a book? Amen. Does what he says matter? Yes. Well, then isn't that what we want on Sunday? Not nowadays. The vast majority of Israel is going after Absalom. Why? Because he's smooth talking. You know, more than once in the last couple of weeks from different locations, not one place, I've had people say, tell me, our people, tell me stories about people they've talked to. Like literally the one guy said this, hey, what does your pastor teach about tithing? He said, well, it's not that simple. Actually, he teaches us just to follow the Lord and give what we want to give. We've never even passed a plate one time in 15 years. There's a box in the back. If you want to give, you drop it in. If you don't, you don't. He said, well, I'm fixing to join a church, but they're making me take this like oath or pledge or promise or whatever it is that I'll give 10% of my income if I'm going to be on the church membership. Massive mega church. What's wrong with people? Why, why, why is there never a light bulb that goes off, goes, wait a minute. Oh, well, he's sweet. And, and, the, and the optics are great. And the music is wonderful. It's just like the rock concert with Jesus' names put to it. So I feel just like I always do the rest of the week. Right. And I come like I am and I leave like I came and there's no challenge to me. There's no, there's no conviction there. There's no, I just feel better about myself. They affirmed my faith. So let's go party on Friday and go to church on Sunday. That's what's wrong with people. That's why they go after the Absaloms. You know what it is? It's a sign of the times that you're in. I mean, let me show you a couple of passages. I'll show you a couple of things about the devil and we'll get into this thing. But I, I want you to see these verses because I think they're very important. Go with me, if you would, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Keep your finger here in 2 Samuel. We'll be right back. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And there's a lot more passages I can show you, but I'm just going to take you to two for right now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and look at verse number 12, please. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What? That's a promise. For, you know, there's promises. There's the promises of God, right? You hear the religious fluffy talk? I'm kind of mocking it, but you know... I hope it doesn't offend you that I mock that stuff. I'm not calling out people's names. I'm not naming your church or whatever. I'm not attacking people personally. I'm talking about a philosophy. Do you understand that? I'm not even talking about a denomination. I don't care what denomination. I'm talking about a philosophy. 
The philosophy in this culture is, oh, everything is perfect in Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know what I mean? Well, he says, take up your cross and follow me. You want to be consistent? Preach. I'm supposed to represent him, aren't I? You hear about him, right? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ, not about us, right? He said, take up that cross and follow me. Huh? How come that's not preached? You want to serve the Lord in spite of the fact that the God promises you if you'll sell out to Jesus Christ, you'll suffer persecution. Amen. Like, oh, oh, time out, bro. I'm an American. <laughs> you don't understand. I got rights. Nobody can do anything about anything that I do. I got lawyers to defend me. You understand what I'm saying? I got a great cushy car and a great cushy house and a great cushy salary and I, I got rights. I'm an American. No, he said, if you, if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. Why don't we have more problems than we have with people? Look at the next verse. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, as, as the end times come, and as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, you know what's going to happen? People are going to accept and believe a lie more and more and more. You, you, people are being programmed to a lie. Do you, you would understand that, right? Yeah. They're being programmed to accept a lie. Now, I'm not talking about COVID. I'm not going there, okay? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Why does it tighten up in a, such a conservative room when I say I'm not a conspiracy theorist? I'm not. You know these idiots were saying Barack Obama was the Antichrist? I've never seen anything dumber in my entire, I'm not, I'm being mean. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean. I love people. I love God. I love you. Everything's wonderful. Okay. But look, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life because according to the Bible, when you study the Bible, the Bible says the Antichrist is a Syrian Jew. Barack Obama was not a Syrian Jew. You do understand that, right? It's, it's just biblical ignorance. It's just constantly a lie, a lie, a lie. Anything but the truth. Anything that I'm into. So if you're a conservative, you got all kinds of things offered to you that you can get into that's not the Bible. And if you're a liberal, there's all kinds of things offered to you that you can get into that's not the truth. It's not the Bible. It's not the word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want truth? you got to find it in Jesus Christ and in his word or you don't got it. Because everybody's lying. Oh, Trump, he's going to get arrested on Tuesday. What are we going to do? Look, listen, I think you already know, so it's not a secret. Uh, it's going to be obvious if you listen to me any length of time. I would definitely be way more of a conservative than I would be a liberal, right? Okay, fair enough. Trump ain't the answer. You believe him? <laughs> you? You know, why, you know why conservative born-again Christians like him so much? I'll tell you exactly why. I had a saved person tell me. The reason they like him is because he'll strengthen our military and our economy, keep me safe and keep me rich, protect my money and protect my skin. Where's the Lord in that picture? I'm telling you, your hope ain't in any politics. And the quicker the thing goes down, the quicker the Lord will come and get us out of here. And if the liberals do take over, maybe the Christians need a little heat to get them a little more serious about God. So what if it's God's will for somebody more liberal to get in next? Hey, look, man, if it'll get the Christians serious about it, then praise the Lord for it. I know, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, visitors. I'm not always this mean. I'm, well, most of the time I am, but sometimes I'm sweet. He said, you're going to suffer persecution. And he said something else. He said, there's going to be more and more deception as time goes on. Yeah. Now, when I say deception, you start thinking the cultists. You start thinking the Moonies or some cult leader who tries to drag you up in the mountains somewhere and cut, off, cut you off from your family and get all your money and take your women and your daughters. And that's a stinking evil spirit. Yeah. But the devil's a lot smarter than that. A real deception from the devil will look like and feel like the truth. Yeah. I am telling you where the devil works right now. And so everybody's so hard on the crackheads and the heroin addicts and all the rest of that stuff. So hard on them people, man. 
because you're sheltered. This stuff's terrible, and the stuff they do when they're addicted to it's terrible, and I hate everything about it. I mean, I hate everything about it. I preached to my funerals of young men that I knew and loved and even discipled, led to Christ, because they couldn't get off the stuff, and they wanted to. They wanted to. Well, why would you just quit? It ain't as easy as just quit. You understand what goes on in somebody's physique? You understand what goes on? It messes them up, man. Yeah, that's the devil. That's the flesh. Yeah. Down in the bar or in the whorehouse. Well, that's the, the flesh will take care of that stuff. You know where the devil works. Well, the Bible tells you. We don't have to guess at it. We don't have to have an opinion about it. God tells us where the devil works. Yes, he does. You know where he works? Ah, he appears as an angel of light. And his ministers, his preachers, as ministers of righteousness. And he shows up with a silver tongue like he did the first time he showed up. Hey, Eve, you're looking awful beautiful today. Where's Adam? Well, I don't know. He's somewhere around here. You know, you're a smart girl. You know, you could be a lot smarter. You got so much untapped potential. Let me show you how. He's a deceiver. Go to the book of Revelation, then we'll go back to 2 Samuel, and I'll get down through my points here. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9. We'll be getting to this in the next few weeks in our Sunday evening service. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now watch it which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out of the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Look at Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should take an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know what he tells you in here? He tells you that the devil's a deceiver. And he's so deceptive, he had the power to deceive the entire world about something. Brilliant minds. The best of the best, the most educated, the most experienced, the richest, the most powerful, just completely taken over in their minds by the devil himself. That powerful to deceive. You know, as you go down through the passage, we'll, we'll get through it and we go to, when we get in there on uh, Sunday nights. He has a, he, he's, he's, the beast is so powerful, he has an image made to him for them to pray to. And they're bowing to pray to that image, and he gives that image power to speak and communicate with people. You know what it is? It's AI. Now, now listen, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, when I was a kid 40 years ago, I remember preachers talking about artificial intelligence, just one that I know of that was a brilliant man. And people used to laugh at him. How stupid is that? Not one person laughed when I said AI. You all knew what I was talking about. Being able to communicate with, with material. Life given to material. And the preacher used to say that. You know what he used to say? He used to say this. The Antichrist is going to come and present to the world that he's Jesus Christ. He'll show up probably at a time or like a world war. And he's going to come in when there's no way to find peace. And this entire world has tried to fight for peace and find peace and find peace. And they can't find peace. And he's going to co probably come down like something from outer space in a UFO and touch down and step off that ship and say, I'm Jesus. Because the Bible tells you he's going to come saying he's Christ. And people just say, well, <laughs> what an idiot. That guy's like, he's crazy. He's a cult leader. But he was getting it from the Bible because there's passages in Ezekiel that nobody to this day has been able to define. And they're, they're spelled out to you when you read the passage in Ezekiel. And it's talking about end times prophecies. And when he details the image, it's a UFO. It's a circular flying object with all these lights all the way around it. and all kind. It's a UFO. And he said, what this is, is it's some kind of object that comes down from outer space that actually is flying in the air. And he spelled it out. He spelled it out 50 years ago or more from studying the Bible. And I used to sit there as a little boy mesmerized. Man, that's so good. 
He believed every word of the Bible and that one error in the Bible, he was brilliant. He knew the Greek and the Hebrew and all that, and he, he was brilliant. He taught us that the King James Bible in our lap is the perfect, inerrant, infallible word of God, and you check every man and everything he says based on what the Bible says. You check every guy based on that book. Make sure he opens and shows you. And then you pray over what he shows you to make sure God's showing you the truth from the Bible. Don't forget. I know, I, know, I know where we're going here this morning, but don't forget we're talking about cleaving to the king. You got to cleave to the right king, yeah. not the wrong one. How do you know which one's right? Absalom said all the right things, looked the right way, did the right stuff, and everybody was following him, and he offered everything that was right. He talked really spiritual. He was going out to worship. How do you know he's right? Good question, huh? Antichrist is more than likely going to show up. The Bible tells us he's going to show up. He's going to present himself as Jesus Christ, and he's going to bring peace on earth for three and a half years, which is the beginning of the tribulation. They're all going to believe a great lie because Jesus showed up. And he brought peace between the Muslims and the Catholics and the Christians and the non-denominational. And he brought peace in the Middle East. And he settled everything going on with Russia and China and India and North Korea. And finally, like a 60-year-old man told me uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, he said, he got talking about politics. And I tried to do what I do with politics and avoid it and bring it to the Lord. You know what he said to me? He said, what we need is somebody to come and bring us peace. A lost man. That's a perfect setup for the wrong guy to show up. When you say, well, let me show you the Prince of Peace. Can I take my Bible and show you? He says, I don't give me that Bible. Okay, so what are you running by? What are you basing what you believe on? How do you know you ain't believed a great lie? You know, years ago when guy said he's probably going to come down in a UFO claiming to be from outer space and all this kind of stuff, claim he's Jesus, People laugh at him. Ah, oh, he's so stupid. I said a UFO, and I started telling you about Ezekiel actually describing UFOs, and not a person in this room blinked or looked at me like I'm crazy. Do you know why? Because you all have been watching the news. That's why. Because what I just stated has already become accepted mainstream to consider that there probably is intelligent life somewhere and that there are UFOs. It's mainstream. Some of the most brilliant people on the planet right now believe it and study it. It's no longer some little weird side theory. I'm telling you, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Except whether you like every detail I'm saying or agree with it or not, I'm trying to tell you this. You're getting close to the coming of Jesus Christ. And as you get closer, life gets tougher. As we get closer to the tribulation period, the Bible explains to us that there's going to be tribulation in the world. It's, it's desensitizing people to what is coming, which is the great tribulation. It's getting the world programmed and ready for the setup. It's a spirit that now worketh in the world, the Bible said. It's a spirit that's been here since Bible times. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's moving the pieces around and getting everything ready so that when Jesus Christ blows that trumpet and he'll do it anytime he wants and you and I are getting out of here if you're saved, then the great tribulation begins. Because right at that time, some worldwide mass phenomenon happens. I know that sounded crazy five years ago, didn't it? Don't sound so crazy anymore, does it? <laughs> Ain't it weird? So when some worldwide mass phenomenon happens and Jesus shows up and gives an explanation for it, everybody believes the great lie. And everything looks like it's solved for a little while. You're getting close. I'm not trying to freak you out. Uh, what, what about all this stuff going on in the news about war? Well, maybe World War III is not far, and that might mean Jesus is coming. I remind you, some of them thought that in World War II. And it didn't happen. He said, just said two different things. Yeah, I know I did. The Lord will do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. That's right. You can't box him in. I'm just telling you that if you study the Bible, you realize we're probably getting real close to our king, getting back on the throne, just like David is in this passage. He's getting ready to get back on his throne. And I want to be one of the guys, when he does show up, who's cleaved to the king, who does not compromise, no matter what everybody else is doing. I need Jesus more now than ever before. Amen. And I want him to guide my life. Back to 2 Samuel. Life gets tough and problems in the world, especially in a sinful world, especially in a sinful nation that's thrown away God and thrown away the Bible, 2 Samuel 20. 
rejected everything about truth, multiplying sorrow, multiplying infidelity, multiplying divorce, multiplying all kind of crime and drugs and everything else that's going on in a world like that, that absolutely can and will affect me in my life and you in your life, no matter what you can run, but you can't hide. You know what you and I need? How do we not buy into the lies that are being sold cleaving to the king? I've told you and told you and told you, and I'm going to repeat it again. I do have more than one message, but this is the most important message I got, so i got to repeat it every week. The most important thing in the world is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Notice a few things about cleaving, cleaving to the king. Cleaving requires some things. First of all, it requires that you and I know who is and isn't for the king. If you're going to cleave to Jesus, you've got to be able to recognize who's for him and who's not for him. In verses 1 and 2, Sheba shows up and he says, we have no, no right, we have no part in David. And he, he gets real mad because the men of Judah went ahead of the men of Israel and got to, G to David because David was from Judah. He was their guy. They got David and they're bringing him back. And Israel shows up and they're like, hey, how come you didn't consult, con come consult with us? We got ten parts in him and you got one. And they're all mad and all upset because of who got to David first. See, it was all about Sheba. It was all about his people. It was all about his rights. And he was mad because Judah got there first. So Sheba's there and, and Judah and Israel have this big argument. And the words of the men of Judah are fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. They're like, listen, he's our king. He's from our part. You back off. Because they were cleaving to him. And Israel gets all mad and then Sheba pops up. And in the heat of that moment... In the confusion and the mess of all that's gone on, don't forget the world is coming apart. Can anybody relate? The world you live in is coming apart. It's not getting any better. I'm promising you that. You think that these young people right now that are in schools being brainwashed, and they're not all, oh, listen, I'm not throwing everybody that's in school under the bus because I've been shocked how many teenagers and 20-year-olds are like, man, that was great. Can we come back and bring our friends? Like, I never thought a 20-year-old or a teenager would be like, man, that was, I like that kind of preaching. Like, so not throwing everybody under the bus, but I'm telling you the vast majority of what's going on out there, have you noticed? You think they're going to get more peaceful with time? That's what you're heading for. That's exactly what's going on here. Israel is tore apart because they followed the wrong king, just like your nation has followed the wrong king. And even the saved people are no longer following the Lord like they ought to, no longer believe the Bible. I was written by men. There's errors in it and all the rest of this stuff. Listen, as a result, it's all coming unglued. There's no final authority. There's nothing we base our life on. There's no, no decisions or authority bigger than Mike Reagan to tell Mike Reagan what to do. I know you don't like that. Because Americans innately have a rebellion problem. How did we start? Okay, so it's fair to say we innately have this rebellion problem. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. If you want to tax me, then you better represent me. Right? Okay, whatever. Fair enough. How does that work between you and God? You know what Mike Reagan needs? If you can't tell by watching me and noticing my personality already, I need somebody to say, no, boy, that's wrong. Stop. Right. Change. It's just how I am. Yeah, how I am has caused a lot of problems. I have to change. Amen. Here's this big mess showing up because there's no authority. Some are following Absalom, some are following David. You better recognize who's following Jesus Christ in the day and age you live in and who means it and who doesn't because you'll never cling to Jesus Christ if you side with the men of Israel. You'll never cling to Jesus Christ if you go after Absalom. Hey, no man can serve two masters. You know what else you got to do? You got to refuse to fight against the king. If you're going to cleave to Jesus Christ, it requires you to refuse to fight him. Do you know how many saved people are fighting the Lord this morning? Come on. I know, listen, please, please understand. I do understand. I know. It is really hard for me personally. It is very hard for me to say I'm wrong. Call me whatever you want to call me. I'm just telling you the truth. And the truth is I have a hard time saying, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. 
because I think I'm right. So do you. And when you mess up, ain't it embarrassing? Ain't it frustrating to go to somebody that you wronged and say, look, you're right, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. It's hard, ain't it? Let me ask you a question. How precious is your cotton-picking pride? How important is it that you be right all the time? Is it worth your relationship with Jesus Christ? If it is, then that's your God. You found your God. You. You're your God. You've got to recognize that the king may want some things out of you that you don't want to give him. One of the things I did not want to give him was this. The last thing in the world I ever wanted to be was a preacher. I I'd, 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 for a long time in my life, hadn't really met personally, gotten to know a preacher that I thought was cool. I'd known a few but I never saw very many of them that were cool. So as a kid, with God dealing with my heart about being a preacher when I was 15 years old, I said, no way, man. And I spent six years of my life fighting the king. And those are the six worst years of my life. Because I did not want to say, God, whatever you want from me is exactly what I'll do. I finally surrendered to the call to preach. I knew God wanted me to be a preacher. And then I began telling God how he was going to use me as a preacher. And you want to know the funny thing? Everybody that knew me agreed with me. Everybody. Everybody said you should be an evangelist or a missionary in like a third world country somewhere. Like Haiti. If we can find anything rougher, that would be where you should go. And that was what I agreed to. I thought, yeah, I know. I could be an evangelist. So I like to travel, or I could be a missionary. Everybody. You know what people told me? Don't be a pastor. But you know what God kept telling me? God kept telling me, I want you to be a pastor. Me and God, we had a problem with that. I had a big problem with that. I became a pastor and probably did not accept being a pastor for almost seven or eight years of my pastoring. And then I realized one day, like, holy cow, God made me a, actually made me a pastor. I'm, I'm a, I, I, I am, that's what I am. It's not what I do, it's, what, it's, what I, it's in me, it's what I am. And I love it. I wouldn't want to do anything else with my life. There's nothing you could offer me. I don't care how fat the salary, how great and cool the job was, the corner office on the top floor of the biggest sky rise. I don't care what you would get. I don't care where you would. There's nothing I'd rather do than be a pastor. Used to be I wanted to be a preacher. Today, I want to be a pastor. Today, it's more important to me to watch your family grow to get old together and get gray hair, to watch our kids grow up and go from all these kids running by me. I mean, there's a whole horde of them going out there to go to the Sunday school. What a blessing, man. I looked at Dan and Ashley. I said, you guys need to pray because that could be the future youth group. Boy, what a blessing, man. You just, nothing bless my heart more than to be there for you in your bad times. Come visit you in the hospital and pray over you. For you to call me when you're struggling, about to ready to lose it. You got a couple minutes? Can we talk? Yeah, no problem. Not, nothing thrills my soul more. Be there for you in your good times. See, all these people have gotten married, man. That's a blessing. So far, they're still married. That's a bigger blessing. I'm telling you, when I marry them now, I said, don't stink and break my record. Nobody's been divorced yet that I've married, so don't break my record. What a blessing, man. You know the dumbest thing anybody could ever do? And I'm not calling you dumb because I'm telling you, I just told you how dumb I am, didn't I? The dumbest thing you could ever do is fight the king. But there's a whole bunch of people that have been fighting the king. He told Joab, don't kill my boy. Joab said, I'm killing him. You're an idiot, man. He's the king. 
There's all these men of Israel going out to wage war against their king. What are you doing? You know what the problem is? They couldn't control him. He wasn't their bellboy at their beck and call for everything they wanted, and Absalom was. Right. It's a delicate balance. You got the best king there ever was. But he's not suiting your every need like Absalom's going to. So you're like, well, I'm not following him. He tells you to do things you don't want to do. Like be a preacher. You know what I'm almost positive of? And this is, I would never name your names. And I could be wrong. I'm not God and I don't call people to do stuff. But I'm almost positive some of the guys in this room are called to preach. And sooner or later, God's going to put them into ministry. I'm almost positive. You fight that, you're an idiot. I'm talking to guys, ladies, so just, it's okay. I know you don't ever understand, but trust me, we know what we're talking about. You're an idiot, man. Don't, don't ever fight that. And if you put yourself in the ministry when God didn't, you're a bigger idiot. You let the king call the shots. You're going to cleave to the king that requires you to let him call the shots, not you. He knows what he's doing. Following the king and cleaving to the king also requires us to reject our own agenda. Look at chapter 19 and verse number 13. Amasa was part of the enemy army. He was a general. And he says in verse number 13, this is King David, and say ye to Amasa, art thou not, bone of my, art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? He was, a, he was his nephew. He said, God do so to me and more also if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. You see that? Right? Okay. So what happened? Joab killed David's son, the king's son, and it made the king mad. So the king is firing Joab and putting a mass on his spot, right? Watch what happens back in chapter 20. Look at verse number 10. Uh, verse number 9. And Joab said to Amasa, art thou in health, my brother? Just like Absalom. Just like the modern day preacher trying to, you know, stroke your ego and pretend like he's your friend. Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shut out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bishri. So what had happened is this. David gets mad at Joab, and David says, listen, bring Amasa. Amasa comes in, he says, Amasa, go out, gather the men of Israel, and you need to get after Sheba. And Joab comes in there and finds out that Amasa's gone out after him and knows that Amasa's going to take his place. Joab gets mad, and Amasa takes a little bit longer getting the job done than he's supposed to take. Must have been out there trying to convince the guys, no, I really am on David's side now, and it took him longer to get the job done than he and David had agreed to. So Joab goes out there, and he's following after Amasa, and he sees him there. Now, the Bible clearly describes that his, his clothes were tied on him, and his sword was tied on his side. And, and so what happens is he's, he's got the sword, and as he's walking up to Amasa, he, seeing the Bible it clearly describes how tight it was, he accidentally on purpose trips and lets the sword fall out. Now, you and I greet each other like this, right? That actually is this ancient thing that says, there's no weapon in my hand, we're friends, you're safe. So what Joab does in the text, it says he takes him by the right hand. He falls out and he picks up his sword with the left hand. He takes him by the beard and as their normal salutation, they do the kiss on the cheeks. It's a cultural thing. Don't kiss me on the cheek. <laughs> it's not our culture. We'll shake hands, amen? I'm Italian, honestly, the Italian culture even to this day. Then, mwah, mwah, it's, you smack your cheeks and you kiss the air, right? Or, you know, corner of your lip touches the cheek and <laughs> Takes him by the beard and he's given the salutation. And it says that she smote him in the fifth rib. Now listen, Andrew's here. Andrew's a U of M fencer on the fencing team of the University of Michigan. He, he can correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. But when you take that sword, a guy like that trained with the sword... He hit him, he smote him, but you don't just, I mean, you got to think about this. He says, in the fifth rib, he probably more than likely crushed that rib, busted him wide open, and it says his bowels came out through his ribs. 
He takes him by the beard. He drives, and when you drive with a sword, you, you, you don't just drive with your arm. Your feet are planted, you're driving from the ground, and you're exerting a whole lot more force. Am I wrong? You're driving from the ground. Footwork is extremely important. I did take a little bit of fencing myself, nowhere near where he's at when I was a kid, so I forgot everything. I do know this, footwork's everything. And when you drive, you drive off your feet and you push that power. So not just the weight of his body and the momentum, but the power that he exerted in his legs. Their technique was amazing back then. He grabbed him, and while he's pretending to kiss him, he's wham, and put that thing right, and just dropped him right there, boy. He's laying there wallowing in his own blood. His guts are coming out, and he's wallowing in his own blood at the side of the road. You know why Joab killed him? Because the king prefers you over me, and you're going to take my spot. Don't you take my Sunday school class. Don't you take my pulpit. Don't you take my job as the youth director. Don't you take my spot at the piano. Don't you take my job. You see the application? You fight against the king. If he wants to promote somebody else in a position you have or want, and that's his will, will you let him? I'm talking about cleaving to him. In other words, my own motive and my own desires and what I want for my life and what I think of myself does not matter. Whatever he wants is what matters, and that's plenty for me. Like David, if he wants me on the throne, he'll put me back on the throne, but I'm not splitting the church to fight for my position. I'm not splitting the kingdom to fight for my position. Things that hurt the church, right? You know what hurts the church more than anything? when you don't cleave to Jesus Christ more than anything else in the world. You know what hurts your marriage? You know what hurts your marriage? It's not your crazy spouse. I'm preaching now. You know what hurts your marriage? Not loving Jesus more than you love your spouse. Because if you love Jesus more than you love your spouse, your love for Jesus will get you through the bad times and it'll help you learn to love your spouse right. It's cleaving to him that matters. We got to cleave to him, and it requires us to recognize who's for him and who's not. It requires us to refuse to fight against him, and it requires us to reject our own will for his. Cleaving also is something we should do regardless of the results. All the men of Israel, you see that in, in verse uh, 21, 20, 20, verses 1 and 2, every man of Israel goes up after David. You know what that means? You're in the minority. If you cleave to Jesus Christ in this day and age, you are in the minority. If you say, I believe the Bible and I'm not ashamed of it. That's why it's Bible Believers Church. You see it? Amen. Absolutely not ashamed of two things. The name of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We'll talk about it tonight. Revelation chapter 3. Not ashamed. You believe the Bible? Yeah. Why? Because I'm educated. I flip it right back on them before they can get me with it. You know why you don't? It's written by men. Um, you know what's in it? I said to one guy, have you read it? Yeah, man, yeah, yeah. Cover to cover? Yeah, yeah. Cover to cover. You read the whole Bible, cover to cover. Name me five books from the Old Testament. Oh, uh, well, I'd have to go back and look at it. It's been a while. <laughs> You're an idiot, man. You're lying through your teeth. I love it, and I know how hard it is to read it cover to cover. Cleave them regardless of the results. It doesn't matter what the world's doing. You know, they came to Martin Luther and said, Martin, the whole world's against you. He said that I'm against the whole world. Amen. How about that? Where are the Christians nowadays that'll say, I'm a born-again Christian, I believe the Bible's the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I don't apologize for it. Well, you know, the Bible's homophobic. <laughs> I was not scared of them at all. God ain't scared of them. He burned up a whole city. Well, what's he scared of? <laughs> knock it off. No, we're not going to knock it off. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, not scared of nothing. Not ashamed of the Bible. I don't care what this modern generation says or if that just offended you. I'm not ashamed of my Bible. That, that, God, that God that burned him up in the Old Testament, he's the same God that sent his son to bleed and die on the cross of Calvary and become sin for them. You going to be ashamed of that? I'm not ashamed. He's the one that said it's a sin. He's the only holy one. He calls the shots. And I am good with that. 
that have cleaved him regardless of the results. But I want you to see the last thing is that cleaving results in, cleaving results in victory. We don't have time to go down through the verses, so just let me tell you the story. Joab goes ahead and takes out Amasa and all the men of Israel stop when they get to that thing and they're standing there and they just can't even move because they're not sure what to do now because they know the king's against Joab. They know Amasa had converted from Israel to David and it's just all a big mess and they're stopping. They're standing there looking at Amasa wallowing in his blood and dying at the side of the thing. He's not dead yet and he's wallowing around there making the weird grunnel noises and all the rest of that smell of death and all that. And they're looking at him and they're like, what are we going to do right now? They just freeze up. So they drag him off and they throw a blanket over him so nobody can see him. And then they're like, all right, whoever's for David, go with Joab. And they're like, all right, I guess Joab's on David's side now. So they go after Joab. And they go down to the city where Sheba had run into and he builds himself, he buries himself back in this city. And they fill in the trench, it says, and they build a bank up against the wall. So what they did, there's a moat around the cities back in that day. And they have to fill in the moat. And then from there, they have to fill in a bank on top of that so they can run up the wall and try to batter the wall down to get in the city and get Sheba. And while they're in all this process, an old lady comes to the edge and she says, Hey, Joab, what are you doing? Are you going to kill a mother in Israel? He says, Far be it from me to kill or destroy. But there's a man of Sheba who's raised his hand against the king and he's hiding out in your city. And she said, No, no, that they were wont in old days to speak to the city first. So what happens is, as they're running and trying to take this city over, there's this guy gets in the city and he's hiding in there. And this old woman comes to the wall. And you know what she knew? She knew her Bible. Now think about this for a minute. You got a traitor hiding out with a bunch of his guys. You got an angry, bloodthirsty, ruthless man like Joab with a bunch of guys that are for David and angry and ready to settle this thing. And the king's back on his throne and it's all going nuts. And you got a bunch of young, bloodthirsty, mixed with older, experienced, bloodthirsty guys out there in battle take it, fixing to tear that wall down and wipe that city out. And you got an old lady. You know, one of those ones that I'm just old and I can't do anything for God anymore and I'm just useless and I just wish I could and I just can't. An old lady. And she looks over that wall and she says, Joab, don't you know your Bible? Don't you know in Deuteronomy 20, I think it is verse 10, that we were instructed when we came to fight against a city to first speak peace to it? And if they responded to peace, then we settled the thing peaceably and didn't shed blood? That's God's orders. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't go against God. I wouldn't go against Israel. She said, why don't you let me go talk to him and I'll see what I can do. And she goes out there and she talks to the people in the city. She says, look, they're going to come in here and wipe everybody out unless we give him Shimei. Shimei lifted up his hand against the king, cut his head off, throw it over the wall, and let's save a bunch of lives. He's going to die either way. And she went to the people in all her wisdom. You know what that old lady did? An old lady. How could she compete with Joab? She wouldn't have the strength or power to generate the force to drive a sword through the rib. It'd cut maybe the skin and bounce off, but she couldn't crush the rib and spill the bowels out. She don't have the power. Footwork or none. You know she did in her wisdom? She was able to take the word of God that had been given to her and apply it to a situation and keep a bunch of blood from being shed because that old woman had been cleaving to the king She'd been in that book. She'd been walking with God. And now all of a sudden the kids are coming to her with a big messed up situation and God's bringing up Bible verses in her mind and she's able to use that book to keep that thing from getting worse than what it would have been. You, you, see, you see the point of the message? The most important thing in the world you can do is cleave to the king and know his book. Because the wisdom that you get from walking with Jesus Christ and getting to know him better and drawing closer to him and staying in the Bible and staying in church, the wisdom that you get and the closeness that you get in your relationship to him can keep entire armies from wiping out a bunch of innocent people. You know what hurts, you know what hurts the church? When God's people aren't close enough to their king to be wise about how they conduct themselves and they don't know their Bible enough to know how to apply it to the people and circumstances and situations and things around them. It hurts so much more than anything else. You can't control Joab. 
what he's doing, what he has done. It's all coming. But she stopped it from getting any worse by cleaving to the king. Can I tell you this morning, you need to know that book in front of you. You need to be here like you are. You need to ask yourself, how close am I to Jesus Christ? I'm going to ask you a question. If you died today, would you go to heaven? Do you know that based on the Bible? Has anybody ever showed you from a Bible what it means to be saved? I mean, turn to the chapter and answer your questions and let you talk, let you ask questions, find out what you think and what you believe and how do you feel about that. What is that? Does that make sense to you? Can I show you something else? If nobody's ever showed you from the Bible what it means to be saved, you can't cling to a king who's never saved you. He doesn't know you yet. First thing you've got to do is you've got to come to know him based on the Bible. And if you have come to know him, cleave to him, folks. Because he's the only thing that's going to get you through this life and keep you from making a mess of things. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed as the pianist comes. I asked Brother Rob to actually come up and he's going to stand over here and just sing the hymn. I want you to hear the words of it and think about it while we give you an opportunity just to meditate on what the Lord may have said to you this morning. If the Lord's speaking to your heart, the altar's open if you want to avail yourself of it. Are you cleaving to the, to the king? <clears throat> How close are you to Jesus Christ? Listen to the words of this song while he sings. And if the Lord's speaking to your heart, why don't you step out? <laughs>